Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is our Unit 6 H Bio review for the final. And um, Unit 6 was basically 24, and I think it was 25, or yeah, one of those two chapters. Okay, so the first one was DNA biology, and I'm wrapping in the technology here because it was part of Chapter 24, so I thought this would be a good time to go ahead and record that. Um, so you have it now. Okay, I am recording. Um, so here are the big ticket items, top five items to review in chapter 24. So we talked about DNA history, structure, and replication. I would focus on primarily the structure and how we know what the structure is and the enzymes involved in replication. Then we talked about the idea of how transcription takes place and how translation takes place. I would make sure I knew what was the difference between DNA and RNA, that you could recognize that. And the types of RNA, what are the types of RNA? Yes, mRNA, what else? tRNA and rRNA. Yeah, and how we use those to build proteins, and what are proteins built out of? Amino acids. Yeah, and then on mutations, this is when good DNA goes bad. Um, yes, chemicals can cause it, transposones, do you remember what those are? I'm jumping doing it now. Genes. Jumping genes. Good. They jump around. Good. And then frame shift and point mutation. Do you remember which one was worse? Frame shift because it shifts off all the codons are wrong. Um, then on DNA technology, we did this. We know what recombinant DNA is. What do you hear in recombinant? Recombine. So DNA from two different sources. And um, how do we cut DNA? We use what? Restriction enzymes. Okay. Well, go, go ahead. Tell me. Oh, I'll sign it. And then what do we use ligates for? Okay, ligase is for what? Taping. Mm -hmm. Which gel electrophoresis for? Sorting DNA by size, so we can check to see if we cut it, cut it in the right places, or if we ligated DNA. That's how you get your DNA fingerprint. Um, PCR, what's that about? Yes, it's like a photocopy or a copier, okay? And it makes millions of copies of DNA so you can test them. And then, um, then you can do, once you have the P, once you have lots of copies, you can cut it with restriction in, in yeah, na, 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 restriction enzymes, and then you can do DNA fingerprinting on that. And then biotechnology is how we manipulate um, DNA to serve our purposes. Since we know how the central dogma works, DNA, RNA, protein, since we know how that works, let's manipulate the DNA in order to get the bacteria, plants, or animals we want. What do we commonly use as a vector for biotechnology? Plasmids, exactly. So we can use either plasmids or viruses um, as a vector to get DNA into another, a second source. Okay, so that's an overview of chapter 24. We talked about uh, Hershey and Chase that we know that DNA is a genetic code book, right? And we talked a little bit about that. Um, we know that we learned from Chargaff that <clears throat> the amount of, um, in your DNA, the number of adenines will match the number of thymines and the number of guanines will match the number of cytokines. So I could say, right, adenine is gonna be equal to the number of what? Thymines, so guanines will be equal to the number of cytosines, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then um, we looked at the structure of DNA, and it's a double helix. And what holds it together right here? Hydrogen bonds. Um, who did the X, sent the X-rays through the DNA to get the shape? Rosalind Franklin. Yeah. And then who came up with the structure of DNA? Watson and Crick, good job. Okay, so adenines equal thymines and guanines equal cytosines. Remember, adenine and guanine are both what? Purines. And thymine and cytosine are both pyrimidines. All right, 
Um, we talked about DNA replication being semi-conservative. That's because that original DNA strand will unzip and unwind, unwind and unzip. <laughs> and then the original strands will serve as templates for new strands. So when you make more DNA, like if you're getting ready to do mitosis, each will consist of an old and a new strand of DNA. So what was important in order to make that happen? DNA has to unwind, that was who? Helicase, and then um, unwind and unzip, and then we use DNA polymerase three to make bring in complementary nucleotides, ligase to, uh, to seal it back up. We talked about primase in this class, right? Primase laying down primer first. I talked, okay, don't worry about that. Okay, I couldn't remember what I talked to you about there. Um, knowing the differences between DNA and RNA, I'll probably have a question on that. Um, we know that when you make RNA from DNA, that that's called transcription. RNA is single-stranded. RNA has a sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose, right? What else? Has the base uracil instead of thymine. Good. And then translation is using that mRNA, putting it on the workbench of a ribosome, and a ribosome is our RNA. And then um, having tRNA, what does T stand for? Transfer. tRNA then brings um, the amino acids. Remember, codon and anticodon. That's going to be important to know. What's, what's the codon on? What? Yes, every three bases on the every three bases on the mRNA is the codon, and then the complementary bases on the tRNA is the anticodon. And that's how you know which tRNA needs to land where is the matching of the codon and the anticodon. Okay, and so this right here we call this unit the central dogma because we talked about how we go. DNA to more DNA is DNA replication. Transcription is DNA to RNA. Using that RNA to build a protein is translation. And then if we ultimately manipulate the DNA, which is what we did in recombinant technology, which you just did in your Amgen lab, if you change this DNA, then you'll change the RNA and you'll change the protein. And then I'm hoping all of you got the red fluorescent protein in your lab, right? Okay. So we also talked about introns and exons. Exons are what are expressed, introns are cut out. Remember when we did transcription, the DNA unwinds and zips. We put one strand of the DNA away. We just use the leading strand. And instead of using DNA polymerase, we use what? RNA polymerase, and it binds to the promoter. So it binds onto the promoter. And then boom, 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 makes your mRNA. Take your mRNA, you put on a cap and a tail and cut out the introns before it leaves the nucleus, right? And then, so the part that you're cutting out are the introns, and then you just express the exons. Those are what's gonna get translated into that protein. And this is a picture that shows that, transcription and translation. I ate too many goodies, I feel so sick to my stomach right now, I can't even tell you. Are you good with this picture? So what do we see here? We see mRNA. We see every three bases on here is called a codon. We can see tRNA's landing. So tRNA1 lands, tRNA2 lands, and then what happens is as the ribosome shifts, this chain of amino acids is going to be put on the new guy. And then this guy is going to leave, just like this guy did here. And then another tRNA is going to land, and it's going to shift, and so on and so on, until you reach a what kind of codon? Stop codon. Yes? Why is it so direct? No, it, it is the direction of translation because the next new guy is going to land here and then the next guy is going to land here. The next guy is going to land here. So it's going along like this. Does that make sense? So then we said what, what can cause mutations and you could have errors in replication, but that's pretty rare because there's a lot of enzymes double checking that, but mutagens can cause mutations. Radiation, UV rays, cigarette smoke, certain chemicals. All of these things are things in the environment, right? Okay, or we can inherit a mutation as well, like through a family, you know, that's already been caused in the past. We talked about transposones, jumping genes, when genes jump around to new locations. Um, we talked about the frame shift mutation that, and then for you to visualize the frame shift mutation, I changed the code on four bases, I changed it into three letter words that you could understand. And so we said, like, 
this would represent. It's modeling a codon. The big fat cat ate the big rat. And if you deleted that, then it shifts all of the codons. So every word now is misspelled. So every codon is misspelled, and that's why frame shift mutations cause the most damage. Then we looked at um, manipulating the central dogma. We talked about cloning. Um, we talked about the use of a plasmid, which is a common vector to manipulate, which is what you did. You had two plasmids. And if you manipulate that plasmid, as long as you cut two different sources of DNA with the same one, restriction enzyme, then you can mix and match segments of DNA because it'll have the same, remember the sticky ends, you'll have the same sticky ends exposed. So then you can put the gene in the right place. Just like we cut out that RFP gene where it was silent in PCAN and we moved it into Piara, right? And then we could, um, then we could then have that trait be expressed in, um, in our bacteria. Um, we also talked about other strategies. We talked about the polymerase chain reaction. We talked about how we want to maybe make multiple copies of DNA. Um, if we were going to do some testing, it could be from a crime scene. It could be from a fossil, right? Um, it could be from a piece of fish if we're trying to see if it's illegal, su illegal sushi, right? So we make multiple copies. We're trying to find family relations, like the DNA ancestry, right? So you, you amplify that through the polymerase chain reaction. And the reason they can do that in a chamber, the heating and cooling, is because they use that TAC enzyme that they got from Archaea and Extremophiles, so it doesn't denature. Then you can do gel electrophoresis and sort DNA according to size, and you can get some, um, a DNA fingerprint from that. And we talked a little bit about transgenic bacteria, that you could get it to make insulin for you or pharmaceuticals. We talked about transgenic plants that maybe we wouldn't have to have shots anymore. You could just eat a salad um, or make it so they're more salt tolerant for their water, frost tolerant. We talked about transgenic animals. Maybe they could synthesize um, certain proteins for us. Um, and this was just an example of a transgenic um, cat who had a foreign gene inserted into it. All right, that was chapter 24, are you okay? Moving too fast? Okay. Um, then chapter 25 was the control of gene expression in cancer. So um, these are some big ticket items from chapter 25. Um, it started off here. What's the job of a promoter? Do you remember what a promoter was? RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. Okay, so that's what a promoter is. This is where RNA polymerase binds. Um, a regulator, do you remember what a regulator does? It makes a re repressor. Remember the repressor protein? Yeah, it makes a repressor protein. And the repressor protein can get on the operator so that RNA polymerase cannot get on the promoter because these are usually right next door to each other, the promoter and the operator. Okay, so a promoter, promoter um, is where RNA polymerase binds. The, that's an actual, just a binding site. It doesn't code for anything, it's just a landing site for an enzyme, okay? The regulator actually codes for something, it codes for a repressor. And then the operator is a binding site, and it's a, um, it's a binding site for the repressor, and if it's bound, then RNA polymerase cannot bind to the promoter. The structural genes are whatever you're trying to control. So a repressor, tries to bind on to an operator. A repressor is made by a regulator gene. Did I lose you on that or are you okay? Um, and then RNA polymerase, we said, tries to bind to the promoter so it can transcribe the structural genes. Transcription factors can help. They're like the Boy Scouts. They can help RNA polymerase to bind. And transcription activators just help transcription factors, but you don't need to remember that part of it. Um, we talked about what are some char characteristics of cancer cells. Cancer cells are, they have irregular nuclei, um, they have little blister spots on them, they don't control the cell cycle well, um, they, they keep um, making more cells even though they're broken, um, not very much cytoplasm. And we talked about these two genes. These are the two that are really a problem and a cause of most cancers. Proto-oncogenes are normal genes that will mutate 
they will they will mutate so when we talk about what are the causes of cancer um, you know, when we talk about mutagens causing that problem they will mutate in just two oncogenes and oncogenes an example of an oncogene is the RAS gene and we said RAS is like stepping on the gas it just keeps saying go cell cycle go cell cycle do mitosis do mitosis and if you have a proto-oncogene that mutates into an oncogene, hopefully it will be taken care of by a protein like a P53 protein that will kill that cell. But if those tumor suppressor genes making the P53, then they're, if they're broken, then you have nothing to kill off that bad cell. Okay? So usually it's kept in balance by those two things. It, normally they control the cell cycle very well, but if you lose the control of the cell cycle, you become, that it will mutate from a proto-oncogene to an oncogene. If you are out of control, normally it would be stopped by, by a P53 protein causing um, apoptosis, what do we call that, cellular suicide, right? But if that gene's broken, then you have a lot, a lot of problems. I didn't go into all on the test on the diagnosing and treating, you know, you, you might go get tested for it and then there are various ways to treat, but I didn't go into that so much on the final. Um, now, levels of control. This is definitely on your final, okay? So these are all places that keep our cells in check. So if something goes wrong here, we lose control in one of these areas and we can have problems with our cell. So the first one was chromatin structure. So what DNA is wound up if it's wound up, you can't transcribe and translate it. You have to have something to unwind it to make it expressible. So normally, and do you remember when it's wound up, it's called heterochromatin, you know, because it's dark and tightly coiled. Euchromatin is getting expressed. This one right here is the number one way to control, is transcriptional control. This is the biggest control mechanism. This is when you go from DNA to RNA. What are you dealing with then? You're dealing with RNA polymerase. Is it able to get on the promoter or not? You know, that is the biggest, m most um, commonly control mechanism, commonly used control mechanism. Post-transcriptional control, this is after you make your mRNA, putting on the cap, the tail, cutting out the intron. Now, there's a lot of just normal post-transcriptional control because whatever introns are removed, that is going to affect what genes are um, expressed. So that's a normal part in cells. You know, it doesn't mean that something went bad. You just control which, which genes are expressed. Translational control, can the mRNA hook up with a ribosome? You know, just, you know what translation is. So anything that interferes with that is going to be a post-translational control mechanism. I, I'm sorry, is a translational control mechanism. And a post-translational control, meaning you already have the protein, but it has to be folded in the right shape to be functional, right? So I could have a piece of paper, right? This could be the first, you know, this could be what I made as a result of translation, but I can't fold M&Ms in it unless I fold it in a certain way and make it functional, right? So I can make a little bowl here. So translational control would be the ability to make the paper, to fold it into a useful form that I can use, that would be post-translational control. The folding of that protein. And remember we talked about chaperone proteins with that. I think I did some pictures here. So um, here we can see an active repressor is on the operator. So as a result, RNA polymerase cannot get on the promoter. So this gene is shut down. If we, get something, if we get something to remove it, and in the example I gave you, I talked about lactose. Lactose will bind to the repressor, and that's the lac operon. It'll pull the repressor away so that RNA polymerase can get on the promoter and you can transcribe these structural genes. Who made the repressor? The regulator gene made the repressor. Yeah. This okay. gene's still food. I, don't have food over here. I, I have a ton of it. Right? They were just too nice. Are you looking for 
Um, we are getting pretty close. Okay. Yeah, I've just got three slides left and then I am done. Okay. Um, yay, study hard though for your final. Okay, and I have some tips about the final too, I'll tell you right now, okay, as soon as I finish this. Okay, so here we can see the regulator gene is coding for this active repressor, it's here. Can you see how it's on the operator? If lac lactose got on here, it would remove the repressor so RNA polymerase can get on the promoter. So here's a picture here showing the same thing, you know, because I wanted to beat that dead horse and here, this one. Those are the pictures in your book. Um, Transcription factors just help RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter, and that's more typical in a eukaryotic cell. Repressors are more typical in a prokaryotic cell. In a eukaryotic cell, it's all about um, getting help to bind on. Okay, and then this is comparing um, heterochromatin, this dark staining DNA, is meaning it's put away, it's not active, compared to euchromatin which is light, non-staining, it means it's getting transcribed. Um, know this, I, I think I asked a question about this, heterochromatin um, is inactive, and remember we saw those were bar bodies, because females have two X chromosomes, and one of them condenses, and um, only one X is active at a time. Okay, here we can see transcriptional control, can RNA polymerase get on the promoter or not? This is post-transcriptional control. When you put on the cap and the tail and you cut out the introns before it leaves the nucleus, that's all post-transcriptional control. Anything that has to do with making the protein is translational control, and anything that has to do with the folding of that polypeptide at the end is post-translational control. So here's translational control, making the protein, and the folding of the protein is post-translational control. Um, I talked about this already. You can look at the difference between cancer cells and non-cancerous cells. I don't think I asked a lot of questions on that. Hi, sweetheart. I'm thinking back now. Did I or did I not? I can't remember, actually. So here you can see a lot of nuclei, small cytoplasm, real coarse chromatin is typical of a cancer cell. Um, it defies the normal cell cycle. Remember the... Um, Proto-oncogenes, if they go bad and become oncogenes, they say go cell cycle, go cell cycle, go. And normally a P53 gene would wipe out that bad cell. But, hello my dear, do you need me to do something? Okay, um, would wipe out that cell, but, um, but if the P53, if the tumor suppressor gene, if something's wrong with that, I have been eating your guys' goodies all day long and I am now sick to my stomach, um, then, then it will go ahead and, and develop into cancer. Now the problem is normally this cell right here, there's not enough nutrients to keep it alive, but a process called angiogenesis where it says, remember here, little blood vessels, and if blood vessels grow to it, and then it gives it, brings it nutrients, then it can keep growing and growing and growing. Oh, and I preempted it. There's some angiogenesis right there. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit already. Proto-oncogene, if it becomes an oncogene, it becomes cancerous, I already said that, and we talked about the example, RAS is like stepping on the gas. And then tumor suppressor genes stop that cell. P53 gene is um, the most common one. We talked about that you could get cancer because you could inherit it from your family. Um, how could somebody in your family have gotten it? Well, it could have been in the, in the environment that caused them to have it. You know, here we can see obesity can lead to that. Things like things found in cigarette smoke, um, UV radiation can cause it, and other chemicals can also cause DNA to mutate. And that is the end. Yay! Yeah. Oh, the little tip I was going to give you about your final, because I just finished writing it today. I asked 80 questions, 80 times two is what? 160. But I'm actually gonna enter it in my grade book is out of 150 points. So you have the potential of missing 10 and it not harming you at all, but you also have the potential of what? 10 extra credit points, depending on if you nail it or not. Right, so that extra credit will be earned extra credit. It's not like, oh, here, you get to have it, right? But you have wiggle room if you need it, and if you really know your business, then you can get those extra points too. All right, good deal? 
All right, you know that I love you? Okay, have a piece of toast. <laughs>